Since this unit is about bonding, in this lesson we're going to learn how to take uh, what I call particle models, sort of representations of compounds like these two down below. You can see that a couple of different atoms, boron and fluorine, have come together and form a compound. Well, how do we represent that appropriately in terms of a formula? So in other words, a formula like BF3. Now looking at these two, it's pretty obvious what's going on here, I think, but we're gonna look at some more complex representations too. So we're gonna look at models like these two and turn them into formulas like these. And if, you may if you're wondering what these parentheses are, we're gonna get to that at the end. So in this lesson, we're just learning how to write formulas from models, but in the next lesson, we're going to learn how we could predict what the formula would be even without a model. Okay, so let's look at these two. If I look at these representations, let's say that I think that the, the blue atom here is representing a nitrogen and the white atoms are representing hydrogens, right? Well, if I wanted to write a formula for this compound, this molecule, I would definitely write NH with a little subscripted 3 down below, that would be a good formula for that particular compound. And if the blue ones are nitrogens, then if I wanted to represent this particular element, I would write N with a little 2. So the subscript tells us how many of each type we have. If these were hydrogens, then this one we'd represent as being H2, right? And so we have two separate elements here, but over here we have a compound. And that's the important thing to, re to understand about how chemists use formulas, is that subscript, that little tiny number, always comes immediately after the element that it represents, and it's telling you how many there are, okay? Now, typically, of course, as you can imagine, chemists don't often write a one if, it's, if there's only one of them. And I'm sure we'll see an example of that in our next few that we're gonna do here as well. Let's say that in this case, the red one represents an oxygen and the white one represents a hydrogen. If I wanted to write a formula for this, I might just write OH. Now you might uh, wonder, well, why can't I write HO? And we're gonna answer that on the next page, but for the moment, we're not gonna worry about it too much. If I told you we're looking at this compound and that's an O and that's an O, that's probably not my best color, right? And that's an H and that's an H. If I were gonna write this as sort of HO like that, what number would go here? A two, definitely. What number would go here? A two, right? So it would be H2O2, which by the way is hydrogen peroxide. So that's how we would write that compound. What about this one? Each, each um, uh, red thing represents an oxygen, so we'd simply write O2. What about this one? How would you write this one? If each white thing represents a hydrogen, you'd write H2. So that'd be the formula for that molecule. And let's see, what about this one? What do you think the formula for that one would be? Well, that's an H, and that's an H, and that's an O, so this would be H2 with a little O. That's water, right? And this is just O. By the way, just O doesn't exist. It has to be really that's, that's oxygen right there. So that's how you represent them. No big deal whatsoever. And notice that if there's only one of them, like there was only one oxygen here, we can put a one there if you want to, but you don't have to. Most of the time we don't. All right, now there are other kind of representations too. These are called Lewis structures, and we're gonna learn how to draw them later, but you can see writing the formula for this one, not too bad. Its formula would be SF6. But you might wonder, how do I know which atom gets listed first? Well, the answer is the one in the middle gets listed first. So I want you to type in the formula for this one. Did you get NBR with a little three? Now, I know in Edpuzzle you can't often do subscripts. It's okay, you just type in NBR3. What about this one? SeCl4. Because there were four chlorines, we have to have a little subscript four, and Se, there was only one of them, and I didn't put a one in there. I want you to check and see your writing really quick. It's really important that that first letter is capitalized and the second one is lowercase because the symbol for selenium is this. It is not that. Whenever you have two, um, uh, two uh, what do you call them, uh, letters in a, in a symbol, the second one is not capitalized, right? So that's exactly right. How do we know which atom goes in the middle? Well, in a Lewis structure, the one, or the one in the middle is the one that gets listed first. Sorry, I said that backwards. All right?
Let's try a couple more. What about this one? What would be the formula for this one? Did you get CABR2? Absolutely, because there were two bromines. What about this one? Now remember, the one in the middle goes first. I'll let you decide uh, how to put what the order for the other two. I'm going to go COCL. There was one C, one O, and two CL, so I'm going to write it like that. Now, if you wrote it this way, that's perfectly fine as well. Not a big deal. If you're wondering about the order of things, there are some rules for the orders beyond the first one being in the middle, but not a big deal for right now. So if we're doing these kind of structures, the one in the middle always goes first. But what about these? Now, really, the ones we were just looking at were covalent compounds. These are ionic. How would you decide which one goes first? Should you put the sodium or the oxygen? Well, there's a second rule. If they're charged, as they always are in ionic ones, the positively charged one goes first. So you really would put Na first and you'd put O, so you'd have a little two like that, right? Na2O, that would be the formula of this ionic compound. What about this one? And I'll tell you, I'm being a little bit tricky. I want you to write in the formula for that one. Did you remember the positive one goes first? So I would do ALS. There are two aluminums and three sulfurs, right? One, two, three sulfurs and two aluminums. Just like over here, there were two sodiums and one oxygen. So if you have things that are charged, the positive one always gets listed first. And you notice we don't write the charges in there. The charges don't show up but the positive one goes first. All right, now let's get to those ones that had parentheses. And I will tell you, I want you to breathe and relax here because we're gonna spend a lot more time in this unit looking at these. So if you're not super comfortable with what's going on here, don't worry about it too much, but I think I, I wanna explain the idea to you here. So what do the parentheses mean? Well, what they mean is the compound has little parts of it that are grouped. You see there's an NH4 group here and an NH4 group here. Well, that's why they put the NH4 together. And do you see how there's one, two of them? That's why they put a little two down there, was to indicate that there were two of those things. So you put it in parentheses to say it's a group, and the two tells you that there were two of those groups. Now, there's only one SO4, so you notice they didn't put parentheses around it. You could if you wanted to. If you wanted to go like that, you could. But there's only one of those, right? And we typically don't put a one on things. So that's what the parentheses mean in these bigger, more complex compounds. I want you to try this one. Now, I told you I don't want you to worry about it, but I do want you to use parentheses and see if you could decide, well, what goes first? Is it this calcium part or this NO3 group? And what would be the subscripts for it? Okay, well, the positive ion goes first. Remember that rule in ionic ones? And then I have to write the NO3, right? N and three O's. It's a group, so I'm gonna put parentheses around it. And there's one of them here and one of them there. So it'd be CaNO3 with a little two down there. So that's what the parentheses mean is those things are like little groups. They're little, little things that stick together. Let's try this one. I want you to see if you can write the formula for this one. Well, the Mg would go first because it's positive, and then this is a group, and that's a group. It really is bugging me to write HO here, but we're going to let it go because that's how they've got it drawn. And there's one here, and there's another one there, so I want to say there's two of them. That little two means there's two of them. Okay, so these more complex ones, they're not going to show up in a, for a few days, but I wanted to introduce them so that you had a feeling for what they were like. Now, where are we going next with this? Well, what we're going next with this is how could you write these formulas without these diagrams? It turns out if you know the charges of them, it's very useful for figuring out the formulas. So we're going to start with how do you simply write formulas of ionic compounds only using the periodic table. But today all we did was how could we take these molecule representations, these particle diagrams, and turn them into formulas.